This is Dream Power Radio, the place where your dreams turn into reality. Here is your host, Debbie Specter Weissman. Hello, 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 and welcome to Dream Power Radio. This is the place where we talk about dreams, both daytime and nighttime dreams, and how you can use them to rediscover the truth of who you are. I want to focus on that last line I just said. Rediscover the truth of who you really are. One thing I've noticed in my years as a dream life coach is how easy it is for all of us to hide from our truth. We tell ourselves and others that I'm fine, I'm okay, even when in the pit of our stomachs we feel that somehow things aren't all right as they stand. We'll pretend that we're fine when we feel sick. We'll say things are good when we're afraid of what the future will hold. But in order for us to live our dream lives, we have to dig down and admit our truths. It's only then that we can grow and live our lives with integrity. This is something my guest today knows all too well. For over two decades, Donna Tashjian has been helping her clients rediscover their truths. Through her vibrant living programs, she's been able to help them turn fear into excitement and shed the lies that keep them stuck in despair. Donna is also the author of the book, An Umbrella on a Sunny Day, and hosts the podcast, You Were Designed for Greatness. Welcome to Dream Power Radio, Donna. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure being here. So, Donna, why do you say we were designed for greatness? Oh, well, I guess I say it because it's true. (laughs) (laughs) That's in its simplest form. Learning that we are designed for greatness, but the question is, is what does greatness look like for you? Because we often think it's something different than yourself. I'll put it that way. We compare. It's like, I'm not that grand or whatever, but understanding what's actually great is when you're you. The world needs you to be you, authentically you. And and for me, finding out how to be authentically me has been a journey. I don't know about you. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Discovering who I really am and what I really love and what my really gifts are has been one of my favorite journeys. Well, not always favorite, but <laughs> but most of the time, because sometimes learning about who we really are comes when there's adversity. And that, it, that part isn't always like, yay. But the things that we learn as we go through adversity or difficult things in our life and be discovering who we really are, that we're much stronger than we think. And not having to be who other people think we should be. Well, and also because we see that a lot of women hide from their greatness. Why do you think this is the case then? Hide. I think that we hide to try to feel safe, to be able to protect ourselves. And for some reason, at some point in our life, something that you have said, or I'll say me, have said was wrong, not okay, maybe told to be quiet and not saying it a nice way or not valued. And so if I, if I don't value what my voice carries, the thoughts that I have, and I've been told I'm wrong, then I begin to hide because I, we, our basic need is for love and acceptance. And if you're going to reject me, at least it appears rejection, then I'm not going to do that, right? Because that causes pain. So we end up hiding who we truly are. But we think it helps, but anybody that's done it actually knows it doesn't. It doesn't really help. It doesn't make me feel safe. It makes me still feel unvalued. And it also prevents me from having deep relationships because if I'm wearing a mask, you can't really know me. And so as we can begin to be authentic and move through that and begin to share our voice in small ways and grow in that in boldness, then we can actually have the things that we actually want. Mm. Love and acceptance. That is so true. But tell me about your journey, because I have the feeling that perhaps uh, you weren't always living your truth. 
Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) No, not always. I grew up in a blended family, which is rather common today, was not nearly as common to me, at least in my sphere, when I was a child. And I, in the, in the merger of the two families, I inherited three brothers and I was the only girl for a while. So you can imagine the amount of teasing and bugging and things that little boys just seem to do. My mother's response, and as an adult, I can totally see it. My mother's response was, well, if you'll quit crying and reacting, they'll leave you alone. So in essence, what was communicated is stuff your feelings, pretend like it's okay, and eventually they'll leave you alone. I'm not sure that it worked that way. (laughs) And and that you really want them to leave you alone. I mean, I think you probably wanted, you know, some interaction there. But I didn't want them to be mean and harass me or to irritate me or to aggravate me because they did do things to see if they could make me cry. And so that whole part of that whole picture. So I learned at a very young age what was okay and what wasn't okay in that particular environment. And so we quit, we quit saying what I quit saying what I thought. And then as as a teenager, a very traumatic thing occurred. And at 14, I became pregnant. Um, At 15, I had a baby, more shame, more embarrassment, more blame, more all of the things, fear, anger, resentment, all of the stuff. And so I learned even more, suck it up. You just suck it up. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what, whether it was right or wrong. It doesn't matter what happened to you. Just because we don't talk about it, we just move forward. So all of those kind of things. So I was 18 with a three-year-old. And you, you learn to be tough on the outside. You look like you have it together and you're all, you know, but inside you're just a melted pull. <laughs> I would, think, I would think you would have to adopt a, a tough persona just for survival. To survive. And that's what I'm talking about is we've learned this to survive, but I don't need to be doing that anymore. You know, and but we keep doing it because it's what we've learned to survive. You're absolutely right. Right. But I think we realize that survival just isn't enough. It is not enough. No. It's not, we want to thrive. And so very often we don't know how to, which brings me to uh, the next point I want to make is that you then decided to help other women not feel the same way that you felt by by founding uh, Vibrant Living International to help them discover their own greatness. Why did you call it Vibrant Living? What what does it mean to live vibrantly? (laughs) Well, you were talking about we're existing. And I know you've heard the saying, I don't really know who originated it. You know, let's say we live 70 years and, you know, 50 of it is the same year over and over and over again. And we don't really live. And so I wanted to be able to bring tools, strategies, stories of how to actually live vibrantly. And I'm not pretending that I've got it all together because I'm learning (laughs) as I go how to live more and more vibrantly. I thought I was, and then I do it, and then I'm living more. It's like every year. And so learning how to um, really enjoy life, to really love it and live it to the fullest potential. Which is should be everybody's goal, and not just everybody's goal, but everybody's existence. Yes. It should indeed. One of the methods that you use to help people is a program. I love the name of it, of turning your baggage into luggage. (laughs) So tell me about that. And and because I would think, isn't luggage and baggage the same thing? It does sound similar, but but everybody kind of gets it when they first hear it. (laughs) It's like baggage could be luggage. But when I when I came up with this uh, analogy is baggage is 
remember in college in that kind of age group, I, that you, you packed all your belongings in black trash bags. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's so many things that we have packed away in our in, in baggage, in trash bags that's happened along the way. And they're in black ones because we're not going to look at it again. It's that place that you hide things inside yourself. But the thing is, is when something's buried, it decays and doesn't always smell great. And then certain things rip open a bag here and then we quickly stuff it back in there. That's baggage. Mm-hmm. Baggage, I, in my workshop that I teach, baggage thinking is the things that make you feel Ugh, when you think about it. There's angst, there's anger, there's pain, there's resentment. Those are things that are still not, a, they're alive still. They're still not processed. They're still not healed would be another word for that. And you think things like, at least I did, somebody needs to pay. This is wrong. This wasn't right or just or fair. Those are the kind of things that the thinking around baggage thinking is. Luggage thinking is I can't change it. What happened to me in my life that I've shared a little bit about glossing it over a lot of the pain, but I can't change it. This is part of me. It's now become part of who I am, but I am going to use this to grow and be the best me I can be. I call these things gifts wrapped in sandpaper. They are not pleasant. They rub us the wrong way and we don't know what to do with them. But I have four steps to get from baggage to luggage. Luggage picture is is that you have your hat on and sunglasses and you're going somewhere you want to go. You're going somewhere with a smile on your face. It's exciting. The luggage is pretty and you are headed there. So that's the picture that I want you to get. Four steps. Kind of like packing your bags for for the journey towards your greatness. Absolutely. You're going somewhere good and you're on a journey that you would love. And I have four basic steps to move from baggage thinking to luggage thinking. It they sound super simple, <laughs> but they which they need to be. Well, it's always mm-hmm. simple. It's the execution. The execution is very yes. hard. So so what number one, it's number steps. one is look for the gift. Just the idea of you're in the middle of a pain point. You're in the middle of not enjoying something and you begin to go, where's the gift? Where's something that I can learn and grow? And just that shift shifts our perspective. And we see things we wouldn't have saw before when we're grumbling, complaining, and stating things that probably are true. That wasn't fair. It wasn't right. It wasn't just, and somebody should pay. But shifting to where's the gift is number one. Number two is keep a bigger picture or framework in mind. Let's use the example you may have heard before that your life is a book. Let this incident or time period of your life be a paragraph, a page, maybe a chapter, but it doesn't have to be your whole life. And when you're in the middle of those things, when I was in the middle of all of that, I wondered if that stuff would ever be over. And I understand that. And so learning how to keep a bigger picture, look down the road, if you will, and not at your feet that this is forever. Yeah, that's something I think a lot of people find hard to do, because when you are in the middle of of something terrible, of something negative, you do think this is going to never end. It's going to go on and on and on. But you're right. It doesn't. You know, there's the old cliche, time heals all wounds, which isn't always right. But time does help. It gives perspective. It does. It yeah. does. It gives you the, the chance to gain that perspective. Uh, we're going to talk more about these steps right after our break. We are talking with Donna Tashton, and we'll be right back. If you're not pleased with the trajectory of your life, the time to begin your own personal transformation is now, and your dreams can help pave the way. How? by tapping into your unvoiced confidence. What is unvoiced confidence, you say? It's acceptance of your abilities and qualities. It's a state of mind coming from liking and even loving yourself 
and feeling free to say or do anything you want without concern for the judgment of others. You were born confident, but may have had it chipped away little by little by the negative self-beliefs you've picked up over the years. If you're looking for the heightened energy, clarity of thought, and the feeling of being more alive that comes from self-confidence, you can rediscover it by paying attention to your dreams. Need some help doing this? Go to my website, thedreamcoach.net, and sign up for my complimentary dream discovery session. I can help show you how your dreams can help you return to the confident person you were always meant to be. Again, go to thedreamcoach.net, thedreamcoach.net. Welcome back to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Specter weissman Yes, welcome back to Dream Power Radio. I'm your host, Debbie Specter weissman and we're speaking with Life Mastery Coach Donna Tashjian. Well, Donna, you were telling us about your turning baggage into luggage program and and we got through the first two steps you say there are two more so so what would step number three be number three is having compassion for others or another word would be forgiveness yes i said it forgiveness and that is a big this is a big part of turning our baggage into luggage and actually being free I have done entire episodes on what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. And why do we find it so difficult to do? But to suffice us to say today is that that is an important step is we don't know what it was like to walk in somebody else's shoes. And whatever that is, forgiveness will set you free. That's number three. Yeah, and I tell you about that because you said earlier about the idea of, you know, if something isn't going right, we want somebody to pay. And so if you say, well, forgive that person and you say, no, 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 I want them to pay for it. So yeah, it can be very difficult to get to that point where you can forgive. How, how I just want to touch on this because I think it's such an important point. Mm-hmm. When you in, are in that headspace of, you know, wanting revenge or wanting, you know, some some retribution or something. How do you get to forgiveness? Well, one of the main things about unforgiveness is is it is like drinking poison. Unforgiveness is like I am drinking poison and hoping you get sick or the other person gets sick or dies. <laughs> and some people might say, and it doesn't work that way. And so I unforgiveness hurts me. And I ask the women that I'm working with is, okay, so you haven't forgiven them. Have they paid? Are you somehow penalizing them? Or are you the one that's in misery? And so as we begin to unpack, unforgiveness isn't saying they're going to get away with it. A lot of people say, how can I forgive? They're not even sorry. Or they keep doing it. They didn't just do it once. They did it again and again and again. And you want me to forgive them? All of those kind of emotions are attached to it. But understanding that forgiveness sets me free. It doesn't mean it was okay. It doesn't mean it was right. It doesn't even mean they're going to get away with it. Because in the way I word it is everybody sows what they reap. My mom in the South said, everybody's chickens come home to roost. (laughs) And so whatever they they dealt out, they will receive back. And that same thing applies to me. So if I step into forgiveness, which is a choice, not an emotion, if I step and choose to forgive, I am also going to reap the benefit of peace and joy and healing from the choices that I make. Such an important point. Yes. Uh, so, and what's step number four? And step number four is get support and help. We weren't meant to do this alone. Get a counselor, coach, a good friend, get support to help you through this. There's already somebody who's walked in your shoes. We think we're the only ones, but we're not. And so learning how to get support is number four. It's so true. I mean, the the idea of feeling alone, and very often when you are in that that headspace, 
you do feel so alone. So knowing that there are others out there who who will hold your hand and get you through it it is such an important, important point point to make. Uh, When you're going through uh, a situation where, you know, in like in the case of your brothers where they were mean to you or another kind of incident where you are not getting you know, the affirmation from other people that you are important, you are special. It just chips away at your self-esteem. And when it happens enough and enough and enough, it spirals down, not only just lack of self-esteem, but actually self-loathing. So what are your tips for for women to help them feel good about themselves again? Well, the four that I talked about are part of the process. Because, and then sometimes the person we need to forgive is ourself as well. And so those four steps are really key in working through any traumatic, painful, disappointing. There's all different words we could use to describe things that happened to us that we didn't expect. We didn't think it would be this way. The other thing that helped me through was, for me personally, is having a relationship with God. But that was that that's part of my story that helped me through. I wouldn't be where I am today without that. So getting so getting in touch with the four steps I said, getting in touch with your spirit and focusing on your dreams of what you actually want. I often talk to women when I'm working with them and they're describing their experience and what's happened to them. And they're no longer in it but they keep looking through those same lenses. And I call that if you were driving your car down the road and you're constantly looking in the rear view mirror and not out the windshield, how far will you get down the road? And you won't. You'll end up crashing if you only look or continue to look in the rear view mirror. And so I'll say to them, are you looking in the rearview mirror? Are you looking out of the windshield of where you actually want to go? One of my favorite declarations that I have used for my life is my past does not determine my future. And then I add, unless I let it. Mm -hmm. And so learning that to be able to do the four steps I've shared, developing some your spiritual life, and begin to plan where you want to go. That's why I resonated with the dream in your in the title of your podcast is because when we're in the middle of the pain, we don't dream. We don't think, I'm surviving. I'm looking in the rear view mirror expecting more of what I had. But what would you like instead? Mm-hmm. If you could have any life you wanted, what would that look like? And begin to empower the women that I work with and everyone listening What's the life you would love and begin to dream and and let it be okay. I often say, just allow without trying to figure out how, just begin to allow the dream to develop. The how will show up, but right now, what would you like instead? Mm -hmm. And they have to believe that it's possible that it is possible for them to dream and and make it happen. Because so many people, when they're in that that depth, just believe, no, I don't deserve to dream. I don't deserve good things. I don't deserve Mm -hmm. anything good to happen in my life when it is just the opposite. It is the opposite, yes. And learning that my thoughts actually create possibilities. I can repeat the past. I can definitely do that. Or I can create something new. That goes back to the book I was talking about. Don't let what happened be your whole whole book. Allow yourself to write a new chapter by discovering. And if it feels too scary, just a lot. Okay, for the next half hour, I'm going to write down whatever I would like to have. And it's okay. Because your brain will often go, well, you couldn't do that. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you could ever do that? You don't have enough this and you don't have enough that. But just give yourself space to begin to dream and begin to think, what would I like? What would I like in my family? What would I like in my health? What would I like in my job, my vocation? What would I like to do? And begin to dream 
that's the first step. Mm-hmm. So it is so important. And also paying attention to your actual dreams that you have at night because they, yes. they can help pave the way also. But one of the things I think prevents a lot of people from taking that next step is uh, fear. And I know that one of the things you say is that you turn fear into excitement. I've talked with uh, many people on this program about fear, and some say we have to conquer it. Some say we have to embrace it. And some (laughs) people say, you know, it's fine just the way it is. Uh, So what is your take on how to handle fear? Oh, you are right. There's a lot of opinions about fear. First of all, it's important to understand that there's two different kinds of fear. This is my take on it. There's the fear that's the inner critic that's trying to really keep you safe. That part of you that says, if you go and speak in front of people, people will laugh. You'll get rejected. And that part of you is really not trying to harm you. It's trying to prevent you in its estimation of your subconscious, trying to prevent you from harm. So there's that part of you that isn't necessarily rational, It's just trying to keep you from from some type of harm. So that's a when I'm growing and stretching kind of fear that's pulling you back to where you were comfortable. And so that's one kind of fear. Then there's the fear where I'm really in danger. I'm and that's a different kind of fear. So learning that there's different ways to process that when I'm truly in danger, it's there to save my life. It's there to protect me. But the other type of fear is, I don't really call conquering it. It's acknowledging it and learning how to calm it and let it feel like, I'll be okay. I can speak in front of these people. Or I'm just using that for an example because that was one of mine. <laughs> like as I began speaking, being visible to me meant rejection because that was all I had ever experienced. And so every time I was in, I was noticed, I was in trouble or somebody was rejecting me. And so I didn't want that. And I didn't even realize that I was doing it, but that was part of my subconscious mind that was going on. So as I began to process what I actually believed in rewriting my story, that that was in the past, but doesn't have to be tomorrow. And um, looking at fear, Fear is conquered. Your subconscious is changed by the words that you speak. And so it's not that I am fighting it or conquering it. I am rewriting it. I'm rewriting my history by the new words that I speak. For example, my past doesn't have to determine my future. Is rewriting it. Just because it happened before doesn't mean it'll happen again. The other one that I love as far as affirmations is, is realizing that rejection is really somebody's opinion. So why do you think there's so many kinds of cars and homes and dresses and colors and clothing? I mean, some of the styles out today, I'm like, wow. (laughs) But that's somebody's opinion of what beauty is. And just because it's their opinion doesn't mean that I have to like it. And so when someone rejected you, said you talk too much or you talk too little or you acted this way or you acted that way. It's their opinion. It doesn't mean that it's true. It was just their opinion of you. And so learning that reject, um, that rejection is actually someone's opinion frees me to allow them to have their opinion but not take it so personal, which I did. I took everything personal. <laughs> I think so many people do. So, you know, your yeah. advice is just right on and very valuable. How can people find out more about you and your work, Donna? The easiest way is my website. On my homepage, there's a free ebook, and I've got a lot of free resources available on there as well. There's a schedule tab, there's about all my workshops and different things. So, there's a lot of information. And my website is the letter I, vibrantliving.com. Wonderful. Well, Donna, thank you so much for being on Dream Power Radio today. My pleasure. It's been a blast. Oh, great. Well, we've been speaking with Life Mastery Coach Donna Tashjian. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If you have, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector-Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody. 
You've been listening to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Spector Weissman. For more information on Debbie or to sign up for her newsletter, go to dreampowerradio.com. This has been Dream Power Radio.